Uh, over to you, Serhi. Thank you, Kermizi. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, hope you can hear me well. Uh, first of all, I would say thank you to all of you for attending this session. It is really cool that you are interested in your knowledge and uh, taking experience uh, from people that work in IT industry. Also, I would say thank you our great organizers team and great company Julke for hosting this event. Um, uh, today's topic will be software development process toolkit 2021 from Jira to clouds. I will introduce you in modern software development life cycle and tools that uh, help to develop software in the most effective way. Uh, but before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Serhi. I'm expert software engineer, uh, happy to live in and work in Singapore for 10 months already. Uh, I work as a backend engineer in a banking domain now. Originally, I am from Ukraine and uh, have experience and expertise in different domains such as e-commerce, uh, construction, telecom, finance, medical domains. Uh, in my free time, I uh, like to travel. Unfortunately, nowadays it, it is hard to do, but hope next year the situation will be changed. Also, I like visit gym, hiking, cycling. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, my contact. Uh, feel free to reach me out if you have any questions or suggestions. Also, here you can see this uh, QR code. Uh, it um, refers to the page with a link to download uh, this slide. Uh, I duplicated this QR code on each page of uh, uh, today presentation, so no worries, you will be able to scan it uh, later. About agenda for today's topic, uh, what we will cover today. It will be 25, 30 minutes uh, session with high level overview of uh, modern software development process. We will go through all important parts of this process. We will get acquainted with the most common tools that help to develop great software. And uh, at the end of session, I will share with you some simple demo project you can play with later. And uh, then will be Q&A session, session, I guess, five to 10 minutes. Okay, uh, why I choose this topic? Uh, it is very important to follow correct project structure and use appropriate tool for successful product development and successful fast market delivery. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, tools, terms, approaches today related to software development. Uh, I remember myself uh, at the beginning of my career and uh, what was not uh, clear enough for me. I see a lot of students and graduates who programming very well but they are not yet familiar with principles and big pictures of software development. Juniors also a little bit uh, stressed when they see a lot of tools and technologies to use. So uh, in what format I will share with you this information. For each part component of software development process, it will be overview and why it is important. Then I share with you modern uh, solutions that exist on market. Then will be useful links for self-study and some action points you need to follow to be more professional. Okay, let's begin. Uh, but uh, before we deep dive in this software development cycle, let's talk about uh, programming, local coding, and difference uh, with uh, real-life programming. 
imagine you uh, develop some your own pet projects yep uh, you are only one developer you write uh, code in your favorite IDE you build and test your code in your local machine your application runs on local host you are only one user of your application you can modify your code anytime and very fast or maybe even you manually deployed your application to remote server remote server and maybe you have a few users sounds good yes yeah uh, is your application work works correct and great no doubts i am sure yes but what happens uh, when your product uh, becomes more popular is it scalable what about high load can you deliver many new feature features in parallel way can many developers work uh, on one project uh, at the same time not sure mm. let's take a look what challenges we face in fast growing real life product usually you need to develop faster than competitors your team is growing your team is developing a lot of features in parallel way new roles appear developers quality assurance engineers business analysts devops designers marketing team sales etc the cost of error becomes expensive downtime downtime now is not just loss of money this is a loss of your reputation also new code can break old features and a lot of a lot of other challenges uh, so you may ask why i compared local programming coding and real life development just to share with you my thought that programming is not software development one more time programming or lead code or local development it is not software development so move to the next slide what is software development software development according to wikipedia is the process of uh, conceiving specifying designing programming documenting testing and bug fixing involved in creating and maintaining applications frameworks or other software components uh, sound complicated yes but uh, no worries today we will meet with the most important concepts and components uh, in next 20 minutes okay uh, what were we going to focus today? Management, collaboration, source control management, integration, code quality and testing, artifacts management, deployment, operation, and environments. So uh, now I would to suggest you uh, uh, take participation in our poll poll one is will be uh about ways how we study guys uh in your opinion what is the best way to learn new technology or tool you can see four options of official documentation articles and free youtube videos course on udemy plural site etc or hands-on experience and practice yep i see the result okay great and uh, i saw that the uh, first place was uh, related to hands-on experience and i totally agree with you hands-on experience and practice is the best way to learn something new also official documentation is is a great way to study as well yeah thank you very much let's move to the next slide okay here i uh, share with you 
big pictures of software development. Of course, it is not a comprehensive model and in different projects uh, can be additional components. I created this scheme to highlight the most important parts, in my opinion. We will go through all of these uh, parts and components and uh, talk about uh, relation between them. Let's start with management and collaboration. Okay, uh, why we need uh, management tools and collaboration tools? Uh, because uh, project management is a complicated pro uh, process where multiple participants involved and working together, uh, product management, uh, designers, developers, QA, marketing, etc. Uh, we need some tool for task management with a customizable workflow. We need estimation and work logging tool. In our modern agile world, we need a tool for support Scrum boards, project backlog, sprint planning. We need reporting and metrics. We need some tool and techniques for forecast our productivity. We need bug tracking, and uh, of course, uh, collaboration very important as well. A team is only good as a sum of its member and the ability to work together. So how usually it looks like in the real software development? Usually we have product owner or business owner. We have some scope of work. We have tasks story, tickets, and this all stuff managed by some management tool. It can be Jira or Trello or something similar, yep. Uh, product owner defines priority and the developers start assign this task to themselves and start working on implementation. What is solution exist? Uh, on modern market. Uh, Jira and Confluence from Atlassian Stack, it is most uh, popular alternatives uh, can be Trello, Asana, or other tools. Uh, originally, Jira was uh, uh, designed as a bug tracker and issue tracker, but uh, today this is a powerful uh, work management uh, tool with uh, for all kinds of uh, use cases from requirements uh, and test management to agile software development. Confluence helps to build a knowledge base for documentation and product requirements. It can be used as uh, organization single source of truth. Uh, Slack. A, is a collaborative software. It is a channel-based message platform. Uh, it allows you to connect all your software tools and services, for example, for alerting purpose. Zoom, it is cloud-based video communication app that allow you to set up virtual video and audio conferencing, webinars, live uh, chats, screen sharing uh, or, and other collaborative capabilities. Miro is a great modern tool. It is online collaborative whiteboard platform. Uh, Miro is infinitive canvas that uh, helps you to ideate, strategize, strategize, get organized and work with your team. And uh, last but not least, email communication. Uh, it is dinosaur of uh, the world of business communication. However, it uh, remains in use even today, uh, not just an option, but as uh, default uh, for all important business communication. Here I uh, provide you some links, helpful, helpful links. Um, so, as uh, first links related to uh, 
Agile and Scrum stuff. Then I highly recommend uh, you these two Udemy courses about uh, Agile, Jira, and uh, real life project simulation. Yep, you definitely need to uh, take this course. Also, uh, other links related to get at getting started uh, guides with Miro, uh, Zoom, Slack. So. Uh, next slide is action points. I uh, highly recommend you uh, pull project simulation with Jira, Confluence, Slack, Miro. You can uh, simulate some project, some real, some clone of real life project like a block platform, for example, like uh, Medium, Twitter, maybe YouTube, uh, social network. Uh, what you need to do, register and create Jira project uh, for your pet product. Uh, customize Scrum board with uh, not only default columns, add columns like to do, in development, code review, in QA, done, etc. Create some epics, populate your backlog, product backlog, write user stories, Simulate sprint planning, uh, populate sprint uh, backlog, uh, then uh, assign one of user story to yourself, move between columns, so it will be really helpful for you. Mm, create Slack workspace, create channels, it can be development channels, uh, QA channels, uh, design, support, alerting, uh, invite people uh, to your workspace. Try to integrate your work with Jira, with uh, Slack. It will be really helpful. Okay, our next part uh, is soft, uh, source control, integration, artifact management, and uh, code quality and testing. Here you can see scheme that relates to this part okay uh, but before we deep dive in this uh, process uh, i want to introduce you devops uh, devops is a set of practice to build test and release your code your code in small frequent steps Core practice of uh, DevOps is uh, continuous integration, CI. In a simple uh, terms, that means developers uh, commit their code to a shared repository, often uh, on a daily basis. Each commit trigger automated workflow on CI server, and then this server notifies developers if was any issue with the integration of uh, their changes. Uh, this practice prevents uh, what is known as merge hell. Uh, how it looks like usually, yeah? you as a developer uh, take Jira ticket, Jira task or story, uh, create a feature branch, uh, implement in this feature branch uh, this task, then you create a merge request. Uh, after code review and static code analysis, uh, if everything is good, this uh, your feature branch will be merged to main branch, like development or master. This action triggers um, build pipeline first. And uh, as a result of build pipeline, uh, we will have some artifact. It can be uh, programming language related artifacts, like, for example, for Java language, jar file or WAR file, or it can be more universal artifact like Docker image. One important thing that we need to manage this artifact with their versions. And also what I need to mention is we need to run tests 
during a build pipeline. It can be unit test or integration test. So now it's time for our poll two. Uh, guys, please answer what are, in your opinion, CI CD benefits. We have five options. Uh, frequent releases, collaborative approach, automated testing, a code is production ready at all times, all of the above. Yeah, I see the result and the correct answer is last, all of the above. Okay, uh, here I want to share with you some uh, best uh, uh, version, control best practice. Always develop using branch. If you are, if even you are only one developer, start using branch. Uh, determine a branching strategy for your project and follow this branching strategy. It can be simple branching strategy like feature branching, or it can be more complicated. Uh, branching strategy like for example at the slide on left uh, side uh, it is uh, simplified uh, git uh, flow yeah where you can uh, you have a development branch from this development branch you create feature branch then you need to merge this feature brand to back to develop development branch when you are ready to release, you create release branch. Um, you test this release branch on different environments. And if everything is OK, you merge this release branch to master branch, uh, create tech for this uh, uh, merge commit, and um, deploy uh, code with this tech on uh, production. Okay, next advice, make frequent small changes. It will be easy to uh, develop and easy to make code review. Uh, uh, always write descriptive commit message. Uh, naming, it is very important. I highly recommend you create some naming uh, strategy and follow the strategy. For example, you can uh, have naming strategy for commit message, um, and each commit me message should include Jira ticket number. So when I see this commit me message, I always can refer to Jira ticket and understand what was done. Also, use naming strategy for branching. You can start a branch name for, from prefix, for example, feature slash branch uh, release slash branch uh, bug fix branch, etc. Conduct a regular code review. Uh, use protected branch. Uh, I highly recommend you to make a, a Mm, development and master branch uh, protected. What it does mean? Uh, this means that you cannot push directly in this branch development. You can only merge to this branch after code review, for example. Static code analysis. Use tools for static code analysis. Uh, doing th this, you will avoid human factors. Uh, tests. Integrate tests in your build uh, pipeline, in your deploy pipeline, deployment pipeline. Uh, it can be unit test, uh, integration test, end-to-end -end tests. Uh, introduce uh, metrics for your code. For example, it can be cut coverage, a test coverage. And uh, all you need to do is uh, increase coverage of your code by test, yes. So um, here you can see existing solution on the market. Uh, 
I would suggest you for um, code storage and the code versioning GitLab CI platform. Uh, nowadays, it is not only source code storage, it is a DevOps platform. And with this platform, you can implement full CI CD cycle. What alternatives we have, for example, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket from Atlassian, uh, AWS code commit from cloud provider AWS, and etc. cetera. Uh, SonarCube, uh, uh, this tool empowers all developers to write cleaner and safer code. Uh, we will uh, deep dive in this tool on next slide. And now I want to mention another tool, Nexus. Um, this tool helps uh, manage libraries and store artifacts in a universal repository and share these artifacts uh, across all development team. Okay, this is a screenshot of a dashboard of SonarCube server. Uh, to use uh, benefits of static code analysis, you need to integrate this tool to your build pipeline. Uh, this tool uh, prevent you of decreasing uh, code quality. When you are uh, using this tool, you will be able to see uh, potential bugs, uh, new vulnerabilities, security hotspots. You will see technical depth in hours and days. You will be able to see code smells. Uh, you will be able to manage uh, test coverage of your code and duplicates of your code. So the main goal of this tool is fail pipeline if something went wrong. Wrong. For example, uh, on code review, you skip some issue because of human factor, but this tool just fail your build and you will need to fix these issues. Okay, here you can see some links. Uh, I highly recommend to follow these links. Uh, read about uh, Git flow workflow. Second link, it's a famous uh, article about successful Git branching model. Uh, get started, guys, uh, of SonarCube. Uh, interesting uh, site about correct version versioning strategy. And the last link is Udemy course uh, about GitLab CI CD platform. Okay, action points. Uh, what action points uh, can be? Create a free GitLab account. Set up group uh, for your projects. Create project inside this group. Set up simple uh, pipeline, build, test, deploy. Try to set up more complex pipeline with uh, merge requests uh, and action on this merge request. Uh, try to implement Git workflow. Integrate your project with SonarCube server. Just play with your code, with project and uh, uh, CI CD tools. Okay, our next part uh related to deployment operation and environments uh here you can see big pictures of these components yeah let's uh, talk uh, about environments to deploy a good correct code to production we need to test this code somewhere that's why usually in a big project uh, we have different environments. It can be development environments, QA environments. It can be not only one QA environments, UART environments, uh, production, staging, uh, 
SAT environments and uh, a lot of other. You only you define what environments should be, yeah. But usually it's minimum four: production, UIT, QA, and development. Um, you can uh, manage your environments as a cloud service or on-premise service. We will talk about the difference on the next slide. Okay. So uh, another important thing is operation. Operation activity is near forty percent of software costs. Uh, of software costs. Uh, this includes support of uh, your service in production and work with issues from real customers. How usually it uh, looks like? Uh, so you have some artifacts in artifacts repository and the next your task is deliver these artifacts to environments uh, you use uh, deployment tools like kubernetes and uh, it can be shell scripts for example different tools and uh, your task is uh, deliver this artifact with specific version to environments. When artifact de uh, deployed to environments, you need to run end-to-end -end tests. Um, for example, you can, here you can see logotype of Selenium. It's a framework for UI testing. And uh, this is a logotype of Allure reporting server. So after we run uh, um, tests, on real environments, we can see the results on test dashboard. Yep, okay, let's move to the next uh, slide. And uh, here you can see interesting picture uh, that explains difference between on-premise and uh, cloud environments. The main difference is price, uh, con uh, security, uh, control management, scalability. For example, uh, if you talk about AWS, most popular, I guess, cloud provider, uh, you no need uh, to over provision hardware. Resources can be available at moment's notice. You, ne you no need uh, rack and cables. You no need to maintain hardware uh, and one important benefit is you pay only when you use. Uh, so you can choose one of the strategy. It can be on-premise hardware or cloud hardware, or you can use hybrid model. Yes. Uh, okay, now it's uh, time for our poll three. And um, I would ask you, what are the three pillars of observability? Uh, because monitor of our software, it is very important. Um, okay, here you can see three options, metrics, log, logs, and traces, backup, alerting, and performance testing. Configuration management service discovery and load balancing. So, what is the correct answer? Okay, I see the result. Yes, yes, and the correct answer is the first option metrics, logs, and traces. Let's talk about this stuff. Uh, here you can see solutions that exist on market. <clears throat> For deployment nowadays, usually we use uh, Kubernetes and the Helm. Uh, for log collecting and analyzing, we use ELK stack. We will talk about this stack on separate slide. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I just want to uh, ask you why we need logs, yes? And the answer will be we need logs for debugging 
on production environments for security reason maybe we need to manage access log it can be <coughs> sorry compliance data industry related yeah uh, next tools Prometheus is Grafana is used uh, for metrics uh, to support uh, uh, correct work of your application you need to monitor your application and metrics it can be hardware metrics like uh, cpu usage memory usage disk space it can be metrics of your services like database service or your application um, for example uh, quantity of errors quantity of api calls you can uh, uh, set up what you want so uh, another great tool is zipkin it uh, tool for sending receiving and storing uh, traces what is trace and why we need traces yeah uh, nowadays we very often develop our application in uh, microservice uh, architecture what it does mean it means that uh, we have a few small services and uh, uh, each service can uh, call other service and we need to trace this chain of uh, call we need to understand where can be problem we need to measure latency we need to uh, control this all stuff so zipkin is a tool of uh, spring cloud stack and uh, it allows us to correlate activity between servers and uh, get a much clearer picture of exactly what is happening uh, in our services okay uh, aws is the next tool or i guess it is environment platform uh, with aws uh, you can develop very fast and uh, just rent resources that you need okay uh, here you can see a scheme how elk stack works uh, elk is an acronym for collection of three open source projects elasticsearch Logstash and Kibana. It is complete end-to-end -end log analysis solution, which help us in searching, analyzing, um, and visualizing the log generated from different machines. Uh, how it looks like? Usually, you have different servers. Uh, you have some agents uh, that collect uh, different. Uh, logs message messages uh, then we need to ship these messages to logstash we need to parse filter and transform to one format this log message and store and index this log messages in Elasticsearch engine yes and using kibana tool and uh, its dashboard we can visualize visualize these logs Okay, here I provide you some links to for self-study. It is getting started guides for AWS platform, uh, um, ELK stack, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, Zipkin. So you don't need to be professional in this tool because for this we have DevOps, yes, uh, separate. Uh, area but you definitely need to be aware that uh, this tool exists and why we need this tool and definitely you need to know how you can use this tool and uh, resolve some issues um, action points i highly recommend you create aws account and uh, start 
preparation for AWS certification. You will spend, I guess, one, two, or maybe three months, and at the end of this preparation period, you will be able to pass this certificate exam. In my opinion, preparation for certification, AWS certification, is the best way to study all this AWS stuff. Okay, uh, let's repeat from the beginning our big pictures of software development. For example, imagine that we develop some product. Let it be um, some block platform like Medium Clone, and we need to implement, let's say, uh, registration flow. So we create registration epics, we create user stories, and uh, put these user stories uh, with task in our Spring Backlog. You as a developer take this task, uh, implement this task in your feature branch, merge the view and uh, static code, an uh, code analysis. You merge your implementation in mage in main branch. It triggers build pipeline. During this build pipeline, we execute unit test and integration test. Then we create some artifact with specific version, store this artifact in artifacts repository, then deploy this artifact to environments, let's say to development environments, then run end-to-end <clears throat> -end tests on these environments, and every, if everything is okay, we are ready to deliver our artifact, our new version of software to production. Uh, important thing is operation. You need to uh, be able to monitor your application. You need to be able to see logs, understand the uh, load, understand errors if uh, they happen. So you need to have access to metrics. Uh, if some metrics uh, is not good, you need to receive alert and then react to this alert. Yep. Okay. Mm, on this slide, I uh, create for you some uh, GitHub project. You can see a link to GitHub project and um, link to YouTube uh, with uh, setup process, uh, setup process process of this project. I quickly share with you my idea. So this is uh, uh, Spring Boot uh, ELK Prometheus Grafana demo project. In this project, uh, <clears throat> you will have some Java application, Movies API. Uh, here you can see documentation for this API. Uh, all you need to do, you need to have installed Java 11 on your machine, Docker and Docker Compose. Then you just uh, need to build this Docker image of this application. Uh, using Docker Compose, you need to up and run in all containers in Docker Compose file, and then you will be uh, you will access to Grafana dashboard and uh, uh, Kibana dashboard. So uh, in the root of uh, this project, I provide you some example of HTTP request. You can play with them. Just run this HTTP request a few times and then go to uh, Kibana dashboard, observe the logs, what happens, what was the year, uh, errors. Go to uh, Grafana dashboard. Uh, uh, here uh, you can see quantity of API calls, uh, quantity of API calls, uh, specific endpoint, uh, some uh, error-related stuff. Just play, and it will be good start point, I guess. Okay, um, that's it from my side. And uh, now, if you have question, I will be happy to answer them thank you um 
Thank you, Sergey. It was an interesting topic. And we have a few questions. Uh, let me uh, share share the screen and sh uh, show you, show to everybody. And let me assign okay. you over there. Uh, I have assigned you the uh, question. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, this is uh, the first question. Okay, how do you find the large chip size required to keep Elastic Search running? Having multiple file descriptor open, is it scalable or reasonable? Hmm. This is a specific question. Uh, I'm mostly Java backend developer, so I guess uh, DevOps guys will answer the, this question best. And second question. Uh, can you put uh, those links in the chat, please? Uh, I think uh, this is a recommendation that I, uh, you have put over there as well. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I, I, I will put uh, these links to the chat later today in five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our uh, next speaker is Zach. Uh, he will be talking about a very interesting topic, uh, refactoring. Uh, over to you, Zach. Oh, sure. Give me a minute. Let me try to share my screen. All right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Zach. So welcome to today, today's session. So I hope you have enjoyed the session given by my, by my colleague, Sohi, earlier. So today, we will be talking about refactoring and important skills of developers' life. So first, let me start with a self-introduction. I'm Zach, a full-stack software engineer at Zuke. So my hobby is actually learning languages, but not only computer language, but also language that we use to communicate. So, uh, so currently, I know Korean and also planning to learn Japanese as well. So I also like to go for bowling and learn new technologies during my free time. So on the right of the screen here, there's a QR code to my LinkedIn profile. So feel free to connect with me or drop me an email after this session if you have any questions. So now let, let me give you an overview of what we'll be going through today. So first, we'll be talking about some key terminology that you have to know before we start talking about refactoring. So there are clean code, technical depths, and also code smells. Then after which, we'll talk about the definition of refactoring, uh, what is not considered as refactoring. Then we'll, ask, uh, we'll talk about why is refactoring important? So what benefit does it actually bring us? Next, we'll be talking about when should we do it? Uh, because there are times where you should do refactoring and there are times where you should not. So lastly, we'll be talking about how do we actually do refactoring with a small demo. So first, before we start off, uh, let's start with the first point. So I'd like to ask everyone, how much do we actually know about clean code? So I'd like to get a general sense of everyone's experience with clean code. So yep, please take your time to answer this. And do not worry if you do not know much about clean code, we'll be going through them today. Yep, so I guess most of the people heard about it, heard about our term, but not in detail. So it's fine, we'll be going through some brief description of it before we start with refactoring today. So now uh, let's move, move on with the first key te terminology, which is clean code. So what is clean code? Clean code are actually readable and easy to understand code. So basically, our ultimate goal of clean code is basically to have a code where once you read it, you know what is it doing without much comment, without having to go into the details, looking at all the logics. So just by looking at reading the code, you will know what is it doing. So it's kind of like reading a book. And once you read it, you understand what is it. So that is the ultimate goal of clean code, what we want. So other than the author himself, author him or himself or herself, uh, everyone can understand the code. So clean code also are also code that are easy and cheap to maintain. So basically meaning that there's no duplication, there's no tightly coupled code. And clean code should also be code that is easy to make changes to and also easy to add new features to. So lastly, clean code should be code with passing tests. So without any passing tests, you can't call your code a clean code, even if, even if you have a, a readable code, even if it's cheap and easy to maintain, even if it's easy to add changes or change changes to it. So the reason behind this is because if you have no passing test, you are unable to verify the behavior of your code. So you can't really uh, say that it's clean code because you are unable to verify whether the code is working, is exactly behaving as what we wanted it to, to do, basically. So 
you can argue that you can do manual tests and test it uh, manually by passing in the inputs and check the outputs. But yes, this works one time, two times, but then are you sure you are able to test all the conditions every single time when you make the changes to it? So most of the time, the answer is no. So it's always good and it's always important to have tests that tests your code and to, to make sure that the behavior is correct. So only then will you be able to call your code a clean code. So what does unclean code or dirty code actually brings us? It brings us technical debt. So what is technical debt? It's kind of similar to financial debt, where in financial debt, we are borrowing money to kind of like expedite a particular process, such as hiring uh, more developers to work on your project, to speed up on your project, basically. So in this way, technical debt is kind of similar, but instead of money that you're borrowing, you are borrowing additional reworks that you have to do in the future by choosing easy solutions over better solutions. So example here for easy solution is kind of like if you have to develop a feature, let's say you have a check where you're checking if a person is eligible to buy an alcohol beverage. So the easy solution will be looking around the code base and find uh, similar logics and basically copy and paste it over to your feature. So that is one easy solution. The better solution will be extracting out this commonly used logic into a utility class and basically reuse this method in both of the locations. So in terms of the easy solution, once there is change in a logic, let's say for example, uh, the legal drinking age becomes 25 years old, then in this, in this scenario, you will have to change in two places. So it is a lot way more harder. And now it's just two places. What if you duplicate it all around your code base? You will have to change it. You have to find and change it everywhere in your code base. It might be written in the exact same way or slightly different, such as one using if statement, the other one using switch case. So, and also we have to test and make sure all of them are working. Where else compared to the better solutions, you only need to make changes to one place, which is the utility class that you have uh, created, the method you have created, make a change there, test it over there, and everything is fine. So since we know that technical depths are not good, why do we actually have technical depth? So I've listed down some reasons over here. I will not be going through all of them due to time limit, uh, but I will be going through some things that I think is commonly the reasons. So for example, business pressure. So normally business, there's business pressure and there's tight deadlines that developers have to fulfill. So this actually makes the, their developer choose easy solutions over better solutions because they don't even have time to finish the features, let alone writing better solutions. So another one of the reason is that developers are mainly not confident to make the change because either because they have lack of knowledge or because there's lack of tests for the code that they are they want to change. So this uh, causes developer to afraid of changing the code because they are afraid of breaking the system. So the last commonly common reason is inexperienced programmer. So all of us actually wants to write good code. Uh, clean code, but right at the start, we because when we are new, we are not sure what is clean code, we might actually contribute to the technical debt as well. So how do you actually identify dirty codes or technical debt? You can use what we call code smells. So just like when a food goes bad, you'll start to rot, start to smell, right? Likewise, code, when it goes bad and rot, there will be smells. So signs of problematic codes. So there are actually five main categories of code smells. So first, bloaters. So they are code that actually grew too large and become hard to maintain. Usually this only appears as the program involves. So example of this are your long methods and your long class. As time involves, people are adding more and more logics into it, making the code very hard to maintain. So second category is object-oriented abuser. So these are your incorrect or incomplete application of OOP principles. So example of this is, let's say you have two class with or uh, doing the same things, but have a slightly different interface. So the third category is change preventer. So changing one logic actually results in having to make changes to multiple places in other places as well. So development will become much more complicated and expensive as a result. So example of this is, let's say for example, you have a code base that deals with different types of products that you're selling. So Let's say if you want to add a new product and in your code base, you have a lot of if else statement that is trying to handle if it's this product, I will do this. If it's that product, I will do that. If you have this type of code inside your code base, then once you add new one more new product, then it will result in many change, in changes in many different areas of your 
code base. So this is one example of change preventer. So the fourth category, dispensable. So these are related to your pointless and unneeded code. Without them, it will make your code a lot more cleaner and a lot more efficient. So these are mainly your unnecessary comments, your dead codes, codes that you are not using. So the last category is coupleless. So they are basically simple codes, smells that have tightly coupled codes together. So let's say you have class A and class B. Class A know too much of the internal implementation details of class B and actually use this knowledge inside their own implementation. So this is one example of coupleless. So as this topic on itself, code smell on itself is quite a big topic. So I encourage everyone to read more about it after this session. So now, before we move on to the next session, I'd like to ask everyone this question, which of the following is an incorrect statement? So this is basically about what we have discussed earlier about clean code, technical depths, and also code smells. So please answer this. So let's see the answer. Yep, that's right. So the last answer is the correct answer. So clean code equals to writing complicated logics with comments are wrong because clean code is not about writing complicated logics. It's about writing readable and easy to understand logic that you can understand even without comments. So for first option, technical depths are caused by time pressure. That's correct. Second, code smells are signs of formatic codes. It's a correct statement as well. So third, more technical depths equals increased difficulties in whether adding a new features or whether making changes. That's true as well. So now we will move on to the next portion of the presentation. So what is refactoring? So we have two key definitions given by Martin Fowler, one of the notable figures in the clean code and refactoring world. So the now definition is a change made to internal structure of software to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing its observable behavior. The verb definition is to restructure software by applying a seri series of refactorings without changing its observable behavior. So the key thing to note over here is that it's about Refactoring is about a change, but it's a change without changing its observable behavior. So what do we actually mean by this? So what we mean is that refactoring is about making your code cleaner by changing the internal structure of your code without changing its, what it's supposed to do, basically. So let's say if you have a method that does addition, takes in two numbers, and after that output an addition of this two number. So if we were to refactor this method, the behavior should still stay the same. It should still be an addition method. If you provide two number, two entry, it should, it should still give you five even before and after, after the refactoring. It should not give you a different result such as six because that is just changing the code behavior. So what is not refactoring? So changing code behavior is not refactoring as we mentioned earlier. Fixing any bugs is not refactoring as well because it's related to changing code behavior as well, basically, because you are changing your code. So lastly, optimization is not considered as refactoring as well. In fact, sometimes optimization might be the very opposite of refactoring because when you are trying to optimize your code, your code might get unreadable. So that's why it's not, ref and so that's why it's not refactoring. So another key thing to note over here is that although refactoring is not about fixing any bugs, it's not about optimization, refactoring do sometimes help you discover new bugs when you make your code cleaner and also helps you to optimize your code. So now let's move on to another question. So which of the following scenario is considered as refactoring? So please help me answer this question. So basically this, I'm trying to help everyone to understand whatever we have go through today. Yep. So let's wait for the answer. Yep, answer is still in the, on the way, yep. So that's right, the fourth one is the correct answer. So let me go through one by one. So basically add, adding of new business logic to code base is more related to changing code behavior, modifying existing logic due to bug ticket, that is fixing any fixing bugs. And as we mentioned earlier, fixing bugs is not refactoring. So cache frequently use data for faster retrieval that is more related to optimization. So the last answer is correct because once you, when you are extracting commonly used logic into a UTT class, you're actually removing duplicated codes and also creating a method that can be reused. So that is related to refactoring, trying to make your code cleaner. Yeah, so let's move on to the next portion. Next question, actually. So I'd like to know how often do everyone do refactoring as well? So please help me answer this second question. Yeah, the next poll, please. please. Yep. 
please help me answer this question. So I'd like to know how often do everyone do it? And hopefully after today's talk, you'll be doing refactoring more. Yep, so some are infrequently, occasionally, some are frequently. So, okay, yep, let's move on to the next uh, session, which is why is refactoring important? So here's another quote given by Martin Fowler. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that human can understand. So why is it important to write code that human can understand? Because nowadays, nobody works alone. Everyone actually works in a team and they are not only working on a particular feature or particular part of the code base. You'll be rotated around different parts of the code base. So you definitely have to write code that your colleagues, your teammates can actually read and understand, can build on, basically can easily add new features to. So it's very important for you to write good code that human can understand. The second reason is because, let's say if you were to write a very complicated logic, three months down the road, you might not even understand it yourself because you do not have the same context that you had when you write the code. So it's good for yourself and good for our teammate if you write code that you can easily understand. So why refactoring? Refactoring can actually help us find bugs. So when you make your code cleaner, it's easier to spot any bugs that uh, you have inside your code because it's kind of like when you're clearing up a uh, murky water, you're making the water cleaner, you're able to see through the water now once the water is cleaner. You're able to identify the deeper problems that uh, that you have inside your code. So you are also creating a code cons consistency for the team. So basically by extracting out commonly used logic and by uh, basically doing that, you are actually creating and defin defining a way for your team to do a, to use a commonly used logic basically to basically Let's say to avoid the case where everyone have their own way of writing the same logic that, for example, I mentioned earlier, the if else statement and the switch case, there are two different types of way of writing conditions, right? So when you are extracting all this commonly used logic and making it reusable, you are actually creating code consistency for your team. So when you are refactoring, you also fix legacy code base. So as time goes by, um, code base will start to rot, your code will start to rot. So when you refactor, you're trying to make your code base cleaner and that will make your whole legacy code base more maintainable. So when you refactor, you are making your code cleaner, right? So it also makes the code easier to understand. You also improve the design of the software and application because you are removing the code smells, such as like change preventers and also couplers. So this will improve your design of your software and application. So lastly, this will actually help to support further development. So when you have a clean code, refactor to a clean code, you are, it will be easier to add in new features, change existing logic and maintain your code base. So refactoring will actually result in a cleaner code and reduce technical debt. So, sorry. Yep, so when should you actually refactor? So you should always refactor before adding any new features. So when you make your code cleaner, you refactor to make your code cleaner, it will make it a lot easier for you to actually add new features. So second, you should, after ensuring all tests pass, you should only refactor only after ensuring all tests pass. This is to help you in a way as well, because if there's any tests that are failing, that means that it's a bug. And if you continue to refactor, you might not even know what is the thing that is causing the uh, code to fail, basically, after you do your refactoring. You might thought that uh, it's your refactoring that caused the code to break. So you, you might take a long time to debug. So always ensure that all the tests pass, fix any bugs before you start refactoring. So when you find the code base difficult to understand, so as and when, when you understand the code, when you start to understand the code, start refactoring it, start making it easier to understand. So this helps you yourself and your teammate as well. So basically, you should refactor every time when you can. So when not to refactor, when codes are not working, when there are no tests or tests are failing, like we mentioned just now. So if you were to refactor in this kind of situation, then you are bound to have a long, hard time and long time debugging because you wouldn't be able to identify what is the thing that caused the code to break. So you should also not refactor when feature is getting revamped. So since feature is getting replaced anyways, do not waste your time. So when code are already in good shapes, do not need to waste your time as well. 
So lastly, when there's tight deadlines to meet, do not spend your time refactoring your code. Instead, focus on completing your features, com completing what you need to deliver. Because nobody is going to appreciate it if we have a pretty code base, but none, none of our features are actually delivered. So always focus on delivering your features first. And if you have time, do refactoring. If not, uh, as soon as possible, arrange another refactoring sessions. So moving on to the next topic. So how do we actually do refactor? You can actually follow the TDD approach. So in the TDD approach, the test-driven development approach, there are three phrases. So the red phrase is when tests are failing. The green phrase is when the tests are passing. So the blue phrase is when you are doing refactor. So in refactor, in refactoring, when you're doing refactoring, you should run your tests and make sure that all the tests are passing. So in the case, if any tests are failing, you are in the red phrase, try to write enough code to make the test pass before you do your refactoring. Likewise, when you do your refactoring, run your code, uh, run your test again to make sure that all the tests are passing after your refactoring. If it's not, if it goes into a red phrase where there are tests failing, fix your bug, fix your code before you do the next refactoring. So here are a few more steps, a few more tips, in fact, on how to do refactoring. So first, you definitely have to understand your code behavior. You need to know what the code is doing before you even start refactoring. Because if you, are, if you don't even know what the code is doing, it's very hard for you to refactor as well. And another thing with this is that if there are no tests for this code, this portion of code that you are uh, refactoring, always write tests for it before you start refactoring. So second, identify dirty code. So you can identify problematic code where you want to start refactoring. So you can use code smells to actually identify these problematic codes. Or even you can use SonarCube that was suggested by Sergey earlier, a tool that actually helps you pick up on all these code smells. So you can do that. So the third tip is to refactor in baby steps. So always refactor a small portion at a time, a small part at a time, because this helps you in two ways. First, you can stop anytime you want. So basically, because you refactor in small steps, you are able to stop anytime you want. Let's say if you have an emergency task that you have to deal with, you can just commit with this refactor, this uh, this refactoring that you did, commit your code, and after that, handle the urgent task before coming back. The second benefit is that when you refactor in small steps, you have a quick feedback loop. Because as you refactor, you run your test, you refactor and you run your test, you are able to spot bugs more easily. So in, in the case there is bug, you can know quickly where is the bug. So lastly, define your scope of refactoring. So refactoring is kind of like a rabbit hole. So once you start refactoring, more and more you'll find more and more things that you have to refactor. So you should always define the scope of, of your refactoring to ensure that you do not spend too much time on refactoring because you also want to complete your feature as well, right? Do not want to delay the progress of your project. So here's a simple four steps of what you need to do for refactoring. So first, verify the behavior. Second, run tests and ensure all tests pass. Third, identify dirty code, places where you want to fix. Fourth, refactor the code. Then you just verify the behavior again and go. this goes in a cycle over and over again. So now, before we move on to the demo, I'd like to ask everyone one last question. So what are the steps for refactoring? So please help me answer this uh, poll. Yep. So the first is verify behavior, refactoring, test pass, verify behavior. Second is refactoring, test passes, verify behavior. Third one is verify behavior, test passes, refactoring, verify behavior. Last one is verify behavior, test passes, optimize code, and verify behavior. Yep. So let's see. Yep. It's correct. The third option is the correct option. So the reason first one is wrong is because you should always run your tests before you start refactoring your code. So the second option is wrong because for the same reasons and also because you should always verify your behavior before you refactor your code. So the third option is correct. You should always verify behavior, run and ensure test pass, refactor your code and verify behavior. The last option is wrong because it's more related to optimized code. So now let's move on to the demo. Yep, give me a minute. So this is the simple demo that we have today. So let me first give you an overview of what this project is about. 
So this is about a point of sale system for a drink store. So basically the cashier will take order, a drink drink order basically. So after taking an order, it will be sent to this system where the system actually process this order. And after that, I'll put an order detail with the total price, the receipt, and also the voucher if customer is valid for a voucher. So this will be the main method that we'll be going through the refactoring today. So the order service class, uh, process order method. So all the service class actually should contain business logic related to the particular domain model that we have. So for example, order service will contain all the business logic related to orders and voucher service will contain all the logics related to voucher. So this is just a convention that people normally use. So, and also another thing to note is that during this uh, demo, I'll be using quite a lot of shortcuts. So um, do take note, do take note at the bottom of the screens if you want to know what shortcuts I'm using. For example, something like this, the shortcut will actually appear at the bottom of the screen. So now without further ado, so now uh, let's begin with the refactoring. So first, uh, the first step that we have to always do is to verify the behavior. So let's understand what this code is doing. So basically we are trying to process the order here. We are checking whether drink size is more than zero. And if drink size is more than zero, we'll do a bunch of code, we'll process a bunch of code, and if it's not, we'll return now. So this looks like the first part where we can actually start refactoring because it's always not good to have unnecessary if-else statement and uh, uh, have logic nested in this if-else statement because we could have just used the guard conditions to check if uh, drinks is less than equals to zero, then we will basically return now and all these logics inside this if statement can actually be moved out. So let us do that. Uh, but first off, we have to run the unit test that we have written here to make sure that all the codes are working. There's no bugs before we start refactoring. So now let's let us run the code and wait for the test to pass. Meanwhile, while the test is running, so do we actually want to do something like this to get order get drinks dot size dot less than equals to zero? No, uh, this is not a way of doing it. So when we refactor, always rely on what your IDE provide you, whatever refactoring tool that your IDE tool provide you. So it help you to reduce the chance of making any errors as well. So now the tests are passing, we can start with refactoring. So what I meant earlier was this. So now you can see that there's a, there are a few options. So these are the refactoring tool provided by IntelliJ, which I'm currently using. So I can actually select this, just invert the if conditions and everything is done for me. So I have a guard condition over here and all the code I actually moved out of the, of the if statement for, for me basically. So now let us run the test again to make sure that everything is working. Now, yeah, everything is working. Let us proceed with verifying the next behavior and understand the code. So basically for this portion, we know that it's calculating a total price. It doesn't really look too complicated and there's a comment as well. So it's fine for now. For this portion, Everything looks, the condition looks a bit complicated. Let's leave a note over here to, as a candidate for uh, things that we want to refactor. So because we have limited time, we are now currently trying to define the scope of our refactoring, choosing only the things that really require our refactoring now. And for the rest, we can refactor it the next time around. So now we take a look at this portion of the code. Uh, this portion of code doesn't have commands and it looks Pretty complicated. So, all right, I think we will do the refactoring for this portion. So when, if you want to refactor this, we have to un first understand it. So let's take a look at what this if condition is doing. So we are checking if today.getMonth equals to order.getCustomer.getBirthDate.getMonth. So basically it seems like we are just comparing the customer's birthday, whether this month is customer's birthday month. So let's try to make this cleaner and refactor this part. So what we can do here is that we can extract this out as a method and just name this as is birthday month. So I'm relying on the refactoring tool provided by IntelliJ. So now you see we have this method extract out. Let's run the code to make sure that everything is the test to make sure everything is running. Yep, so everything passed. So now we can move on to the next refactoring. So we take a look at this method. Do we actually really need an order? Do we need an order as a parameter? No, because we only need customer. So let us refactor this as well. 
So let's change this to customer. Yep, and there you go. So you refactor, after you refactor, run the test again, make sure everything is going well. So you see there is something failing here because we are passing order instead of customer because we changed the method signature. So now we can just update this. This is also to show you how test can actually help us catch this error when we do refactoring. So now let's take a look at this if else statement. Is there anything else that we can do? So now we know that we are checking if, if it's birthday month of customer, if it's customer is member, if customer has collected birthday voucher. Uh, looks okay, but I think we can go one step further by making it more cleaner by extracting another method out. And this method will just call is eligible for birthday voucher. So you see now, once an, anyone read this code, they will actually know what this condition is checking just by reading the method name. It's eligible for birthday voucher. So now let's take a look at this method again. So likewise, here we do not need to pass the order. We only need to pass in a customer. So this is when refactoring tools are not 100% correct at times. And you have to definitely check what your refactoring tool gives you. So now let's remove all this get customer portion. Yep. Yep, now we have refactored this part and let's update this part as well. So get customer. Now let's run the test, make sure everything is correct. So now everything is passing. We will move on to the next step of refactoring. So now let's take a look at this method. We are trying to get voucher code, but we are storing inside a variable, a string variable S. So this is also another thing that we, are, we have to refactor. We should always give uh, variables a meaningful name. So let's change this to voucher code. So I'm currently using rename2 of rename refactoring2. So now we read on the code, we will add the voucher code to the DAO. We will create a new voucher object and this voucher object will actually be returned to the order as a part of the order details. So we also set customer has collected birthday voucher to be true. So if the customer is not eligible for birthday voucher, which is in the else part, we actually print this inside the console. So now we take a look at this method again. Is there anything else that we can do? We can actually make it one more step cleaner by extracting this whole part as a method itself. So now we can rename this as get birthday voucher. So now take a look at this process order method again. Is is a lot cleaner and the amount of code inside this method is uh, much lesser. So now let's take a look at this get birthday voucher method. So likewise, we realize that uh, we are always calling orders dot get customer. So we do not actually need to pass in an order. Instead, we just need to pass in customer. So let us just update this part as well. So here we go. And after that, we need to remove all this get customer portion because now we are now we are passing in an cust a customer rather than an order. So removing this part and this part, we will pass in the customer. So now let's run the test again to make sure that everything is working. So now we have an arrow over here. Let us add another bracket, run the test again. Yep, now everything is working. So is this the final state that we want to get into? So not really. There is one more step that we can do, another small step. So basically this get birthday voucher is actually a logic related to voucher, right? So ideally we should not exist inside order service class. It should be inside voucher service because that is where all the business logic relating to vouchers are at. So now let's move this over. But let's first take a look. So we are only using these two methods here inside get birthday voucher, right? So technically these two methods are only used for birthday voucher. We can move it together as well. So let's move this step by step over. Let's move this to voucher service. So first we move this, run the test. Meanwhile, we'll move the next method. Move this again. 
So now before we move, we see that we are suddenly accepting a uh, order service as one of our parameter, which do, we do not actually need, need it. So let's remove this and then run the test again, make sure everything is correct. Yep, then move back to order service. Now we will move this final method over. So as you as you can see, I move, I'm doing all this refactoring step by step. I can stop anytime I want actually. So here we have some errors. Basically we are using voucher DAO inside order service. It's fine because we have a, we declare voucher DAO inside voucher service as well. So we can use it over there. So here we can actually use the voucher DAO inside voucher service itself. So we do not actually need order service. So let us remove this. Now let's run a test again to see everything is working. So now see your whole order service class is a lot more cleaner. It only contains uh, logics related to order. And also the process order method is a lot more short term. So this portion, you can try to refactor it after this demo. And before we end, so here's another thing. So once we extract out this business logic as a method by itself and moving it to voucher service, what you are doing here is that you're making this method reusable by any other code. So let's say if later on you have an, uh, another method inside order service where you have process online order, you can actually reuse this method of get birthday voucher inside inside order service. So the logic is not only stuck inside process order. So another quick thing is also uh, when you extract this logic out by itself, now you realize that you can do something. You can actually write tests for this. You can test this get birthday voucher logic by itself. So you do not actually have to test it together with the process order method. You can write tests just for it. So I have here I've prepared a test for it. So let me just uncomment it and we can run it to make sure that what the get birthday voucher method is actually correct. The business logic is correct. So now let us run it. Yeah, there we go. All the tests are passing. So that brings us to the end of the demo. So before we end, I'd like to introduce some useful resources to everyone as well. So first two are books uh, written by notable figures in clean code and refactoring world by Martin Fowler and Robert Martin. So the third link is Refactoring Guru. So in this website, it contains a lot of information about code smells, technical debt, uh, and many more, and refactoring techniques as well. So if you want to know more about refactoring, so visit this website. So I have also included the demo project that I've used over here, the link over here. So feel free to clone from this project and start practicing your refactoring. There are actually still quite a few more code smells, programmatic codes that you can actually refactor in this demo. Yeah, so that brings us to the end. Uh, we'll move on to the Q&A time, basically. Mm. Thank you, Zach. Uh, it was yep. interesting and uh, I learned a lot of things. So there is one question. How did you learn all the shortcuts of, uh, of your IDE? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so basically what I do is, wherever I want to work on the, uh, when I work on my code base, if I was thinking that uh, what if, if there's a way to simplify my workflow, if there is a way to make it faster. So I will spend some time to actually look for the shortcuts in the either the IDE's documentation or rather search online if there's any way to help me to improve my process, my workflow. So that's how I slowly build up on the shortcuts that I know and actually use them. So they will actually make the whole process smoother when you refactor. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. All these uh, slides and the videos will be ready and sent to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for our great speakers, Zach and Serhiu, for finding time and uh, do all this uh, sharing session with us. Bye. See you in our next sessions. Thank you for joining the session.